Holy Ghost. Enjoying this chapter. Our key verse is in Acts chapter 2. You guys should be very familiar with this passage of Scripture. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's our key verse. And we have been talking about how, just like it says, cloven tongues like as of fire. So we went in and looked at how the Holy Spirit is as different things. You can see in the scripture how it is represented by different things. And so that's kind of how we've been focusing our studies the last few weeks. And so we have talked about how the spirit is like a dove, like fire, like oil, water, and cloud. And so this week, we're going to talk about a seal. And so it says in Ephesians 1 and 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And those two verses stuck together. There is a lot in those two verses right there. But one thing that jumps out immediately, after you believed, you were sealed. Some people try to say, once you believe, that's it. Well, you received the Holy Ghost after you believed, right? So that was a wonderful the earnest, and we still use that word today. You know, when if you were going to buy a piece of property, what do you have to put down? You put down earnest money, right? So that is a tradition that happened even way back in the Bible days. So they would come along to the store or the market. They had a market back then. They didn't have Walmart, but they had a market. So they would go, I want to buy that. And so they would pay for it, and they would put their seal on it, and they would say, that's mine, I'm going to go get my wagon, and I will be back later to come claim what's mine. Or they may put a down payment on it to hold it, but they would seal it, leave their mark on it, so no one else would take it, showing ownership, and they were going to come back later to redeem their purchased possession and take it home. That's what Paul is talking about here. So there you see a beautiful, could you see the beautiful truth there? We get a little taste of our inheritance. A little taste of it. The earnest money could be like a few thousand dollars of hundreds of thousands of dollars in a contract. And it's only just like a small portion of the final payment. And so it's an earnest money it's the earnest of our inheritance. It's the down payment of what we have. There's much more where that came from, right? So there's just so many beautiful truths you can see there. So we're going to talk about seals a little bit here. This is an article that I found, and it talks about how they found the Bethlehem seal, which was like the city seal where they would uh, mark forms or letters that they were going to send out, and it was an, like an official letter. And what, basically what they did is they would get hot wax, and they would heat it up, and they would put it onto the letter. They would roll the letter up, and they would put the hot wax, and then they had a seal. And what they had was like an uh, object like this that they would press, and it would make an impression. And so then the impression would impress down into the wax, and where the two pieces of paper came together the wax would go across the two pieces of paper so that if you open the two pieces of paper, it would break the seal. So it was a security so that you knew. They'd use that on trucks today. When they load up a truck, what do they do? The last thing they do when they put everything in the truck, they'll put a seal. The driver knows that the truck is sealed. He sees it sealed. 
when he gets to where he's going, that truck should still be sealed. So that's saying that the contents in there are good. They were good when they were put in there. It was sealed up, and they should be good when it gets to where it's going. So here we see archaeologists in Israel have discovered a 27-year-old seal that bears the inscription Bethlehem. The Israel Antiquities Authority announced Wednesday in what experts believe to be the oldest artifact with the name of Jesus' traditional birthplace. So it's not just a story in the Bible. It's really a town. They really had their official seal that they put on documents. This tiny clay seal's existence and age provide vivid evidence that Bethlehem was not just the name of a fabled biblical town, but also a bustling place of trade linked to the nearby city of Jerusalem, the archaeologist said. And there is a picture of it. Now, I can't tell you what all those symbols represent, but if I was an Israeli archaeologist, I could probably look right at those little squiggly lines right there, and I could tell you what each one of those lines represents on it. And there's the man's name, Eli Shukron, the authority director of excavations, said the find was significant because it's the first time the name of Bethlehem appears outside of a biblical text from that period. So other than the Bible, they couldn't find anything other than the Bible showing that Bethlehem had official documents, that that was actually the name of the town. But here they have actually a seal from that time frame, that time period. He tells you here that the seal was 1.5 centimeters in diameter. It dates back to the period of the first biblical Jewish temple between the 8th and 7th century B.C., so that's seven to 800 years before Christ was born, at a time when the Jewish kings reigned over the ancient kingdom of Judah. 700 years before Jesus' birth, the seal was written in Hebrew script from the same time period. Pottery was found nearby that also dated to that same time period. So they were able probably to use carbon. That's how they date things like that. They can use carbon because they can tell you how, they can sell, tell how the carbon breaks down over time. And they can use carbon dating to tell you how, how old it is. One of my favorite places to read in the Bible, you all are probably familiar with it, is Revelation 6. What does Revelation 6 talk about? Y'all should be so familiar with it. The seals, right? They break the seals and the horsemen come out, right? But if you look in the chapter right before that in Revelation 5, he says, the elder said, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Right? So he opens up the seals. And then I saw the lamb. He broke one of the seven seals. And that's Revelation 6 and 1. And so that's what it would look like when they rolled it up in a scroll, put the wax, and put the impression to break the seal. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, the scripture that I read to you, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we were sealed. We were sealed, and we were ready for a special delivery. Man, we are going to be packaged up, <laughs> prepared as a bride for her bridegroom, and one day he is going to return for his purchased possession. How did he purchase us? With his precious blood. He has purchased us. He has sealed us with his spirit. And one day he's going to return to claim his bride. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. That's what it says in Ephesians 4 and 30. So there you see it. You can see the seal. There's the little wax stick underneath it. And they get that little wax stick hot and they'll put it on the paper there and the wax will form and then they come on it while it's still hot and they'll mash the impression on there. So here they have found some of the royal seals of the kings of 
Judah. And I want to show you in the, uh, this is pretty amazing right here. This is Hezekiah. He was one of the most uh, well-known kings. And they actually found his personal seal. They said it's like about an inch and a half wide. And they've gone in and they're going to actually show you on this video. They're going to tell you what those uh, lines on there mean. They read it out to you. And they're going to tell you what it means. And it's really fascinating. And they have this seal into a museum. So they know that it's his personal seal that he was holding in his hand. And it says King Hezekiah. So when he sent messengers with official uh, scrolls, he would mark it with the wax stamp with his personal seal and so they found this seal so this is this is a real neat it's not very long but it's kind of a neat video this is actually uh, one of the uh, people that works in the museum the professors and I'll see if this video hopefully it'll play here let's see if it comes on if not she might have to click on it to get it to start <laughs> archaeological excavations we conducted in the Offal area, we found a most unique item that is the private seal impression of King Hezekiah. This is the first time that such an item is found ever in archaeological excavations. It, this is so tiny, it's just one centimeter in dimension, we can see very easily the name of King Hezekiah, the symbol that he chose to put on his seal impression means the sun disk with wings and symbol of life on both sides of the wings. And uh, of course, this is a seal, private seal of the king that most likely held by the king and by nobody else. And we found it. We found it in a royal quarter. That means that we get as close as possible, tangible as ever to King Hezekiah himself. Of course, one of the most important figures in the Bible, King Hezekiah knows from Assyrian documents. Of course, he is well known from the Bible itself. And now we get to touch him. So when the material... Pretty amazing, huh? To think that King Hezekiah was holding that seal at one time, marking letters. They put it in the museum. 
So when you look in the uh, Thayer's and you look up the word seal, it's basically to mark. It can be to keep secret, but I, I like where it talks about to uh, mark a person or a thing. And so as you think about that, we have been set aside by God. He has placed a seal upon us. What is he saying? This one is mine. He calls you out. When he puts the Holy Spirit within you, he's putting his seal upon you. And he's saying, this one's mine. I'm coming back for this one. I have purchased this one. And I'm going to come back one day and bring this one home with me. Come back. Some different things that the seal could mean. A, a label, a logo, a trademark. You know, you think about God confirming. And really, I, I looked at some of the different meanings in the American Heritage Dictionary, what a seal could mean. But basically, it's... Uh, a confirmation. When he puts that seal on you, it's a confirmation saying that, yes, this one is mine. He has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has called you. He has chosen you. He has picked you. It's to recover ownership now, when you look up the word redeemed, because when I looked in Ephesians 1 and 13, that the, our key scripture where we're talking about how he sealed us, and then he is going to redeem us. He purchased us, and he's going to redeem the purchased possession. So he set the seal upon us with the Holy Spirit, and then he's going to come back to redeem his purchased possession that he has sealed. Redeem means to recover ownership of by paying a specified sum. And I thought about that as I looked at this, to set free, to rescue, or ransom. Can you say that he has set you free? Can you say that he rescued you, he ransomed you, he paid your ransom? He came and he looked and you were basically on the auction block of sin. And he paid the ransom for you so that you could be set free. He put his seal upon you and said, this one is mine. I like what it says. In, and this is amazing because this is just the American Heritage Dictionary. This is not the Bible Dictionary. American Heritage Dictionary. Redeem. To save from a state of sinfulness and its consequences. They put that in the dictionary. That's amazing. When you think about redeem, to save from a state of sinfulness. Can you say, he set me free? He set me free. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt. No freedom from sorrow I felt. But Jesus came. Woo! But Jesus came. He came and he saw me on the auction block of sin. And he said, I'm going to break those chains I'm going to set this person free I choose you I don't know why but he did he chose me in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and so there you see it you trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom after you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you look at that in the uh, NIV, it says you were included. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. That's how they wrote it in the NIV, to put it in a more modern language. It's beautiful. You were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood. Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. You are bought with a price. You are bought with a price. You know what he goes on to say? Therefore... Glorify God in your body 
and in your spirit, which are God's. Christ purchased us. He owns us. He set us free. He put his seal upon us. And he said one day he's coming back for us. You know what? I want to honor him with my life. I want to be ready when he comes back one day. I want to be a bride prepared for the bridegroom. I want to make myself ready. Amen. The redemption of the purchased possession. It's a beautiful scripture. The spirit of promise. This is in the Vincent's Word Studies. Where it, and it kind of keys in on the where it says the spirit of promise. When you look in so many places in the scripture, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. It really is the spirit of promise. This is that. This is what he tells us in Acts chapter 2. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is the promised Holy Spirit. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. He has promised to pour his spirit out. Here you see in Zechariah 12 and 10, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. Hey, I'm thankful for grace, aren't you? <laughs> I am so thankful that God's grace, He pours the Spirit of grace upon us. And I'm thankful that we live in a time when God is merciful and gracious. And grace has appeared teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present evil world. And so, God has poured out a spirit of grace upon us. We are no longer slaves to sin. We don't have to live like the old man. We are not that person anymore. He has come and he saw us held in chains, but he redeemed us. And he said... I'm coming back for you. He set us free. Paul, when he talks about the slavery and sin analogy, this is how he puts it. And as you follow through the uh, book, I love the book of Romans, but as you follow through the book of Romans and you get up to Romans 6, he talks about how we were owned by sin, we were born into sin, we were bound to the will of sin, and sin was our master. And any person who willingly lives under sin, he is a slave to sin. But we do not have to be slaves to sin any longer. That's what he says. We do not have to be slaves to sin any longer. We can bring our sins to the cross. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to bring our burdens and our cares and our worries and our fears and everything that we've been carrying in our life. You know, you see the, the first picture there all the way to the left. I, I saw this picture and it just jumped out at me because that's where so many people are at. You just see them walking around like this. They may not want to admit it, but they are shackled. Shackled with a heavy burden. Shackled with a heavy burden. Carrying this big load of sin. But then the hand of Jesus touched me. That's what we need to do. We need to bring our burdens, our cares, our worries. We need to bring them to the foot of the cross. And we need to say, Lord, I believe the gospel and I'm ready to be set free. And we leave it there. Don't pick it back up with you. Look at him when he's walking away. You can see him standing up tall. I love that scripture. It says the woman was bowed down and Jesus touched her and she stood back up. Anybody ever had trouble with your back? Oh, 
and you can't stand up, you're like, oh, oh, there's nothing like back pain. And you can't stand back up. Oh, but I'll tell you, sin, something worse than back pain, when you're just so beat down with sin, when the devil's just whispering in your ear every day, day after day, telling you what a scoundrel you are and how you have no chance, and he's just beating you down. And the bag that you're carrying every day gets a little bit heavier. I have good news for you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can lay your burdens down at the cross and leave it there. He is saying, return to me with all your heart. I love that scripture in Joel 2 and 12. Return to me with all your heart. That's what God is saying. He's, you know, people talk about God in the Old Testament. He was such a mean God back then. I got news for you. God hasn't changed. He's the same. He wanted the people to turn back to him even then. He was longing for them to turn back to him. I think about when Moses cried out and he said, Lord, if you're not coming with us, then I just don't want to go. Moses, I, I can't go with you. The people, they're just so stiff-necked. They just won't listen to me. And in a minute, I will get angry and, and I'll just wipe them all out. And I just, I can't go down into the camp. I can't be with you anymore, Moses. Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, I pray that your presence will go with us. It's not enough to have an angel, God. I've got to have you. If you're not with us, I don't want to go. And the Lord says, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Now tell me that's not a God of love. He said, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? That's in Ezekiel. I don't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. I want them to repent and come home. He said in Isaiah, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. That's the God of the Old Testament talking right there. He says here in Joel, everybody reads Joel. Joel, the locusts are going to eat up the land and there's going to be pillars of smoke and fire and the sun's going to be Dark and the moon's going to turn into blood and, and return to me with all your heart. God is crying out for us to come home. Why? Because he's coming back for a people that he has purchased with his blood, his purchased possession. Oh, I want him to seal me with his spirit. Put his seal upon me and say, this one is mine. Yes. Hallelujah. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. With fasting and weeping and mourning. That's what America needs right now. That's what we need. We need to turn to God. Amen. Maybe, maybe we're like the prodigal son. Have you ever found yourself in a place where you were just away from the presence of God? And you just said, Lord, I need you. I love that scripture. It says, and he came to himself. All of a sudden, something just clicked in his mind. And he said, you know, 
I need to be in my Father's house. It's time to go home. And sometimes God is saying to us, it's time to return to the Lord. Return to the Lord with all your heart. Yes, return to the Lord and let God begin to minister to you. And when he came around the corner, he didn't see God looking down at him. <laughs> Instead, the father came off the front porch and was running. He grabbed a robe and put it on him. He began to celebrate. That's what God will do. He will celebrate when we come home. The seal of the Spirit being placed upon us is a celebration. God celebrates when we come home. He says, this one is mine. I'm coming back for this one. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yes, free. What will you be free from? You know, when you look in the dakes and it talks about the the Holy Spirit. I tell you, I, I love his lists, but I saw this. He sets you free from sin. But all of these other things that it listed there, I thought, he gives you a peace of mind. He takes away the condemnation. He gives you an assurance in your heart. He cancels the death penalty. He fulfills righteousness. He indwells believers. He gives life. He quickens your mortal bodies. All of these things, as he's doing them for you, what does he do? He brings peace into your heart. When you're walking after the Spirit, when you have the Holy Ghost working in your life, what a blessing. I can't understand people who try to say, oh, the Holy Ghost is optional not for me it isn't the Holy Ghost is not optional for me I've got to have the spirit to help me understand his word to help me pray to give me discernment and guidance as I go through the day to give me direction to quicken me to lead me to help me I need his presence with me always every day blessings Listen to Isaiah 44 and 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed. And I thought about it when I was reading that. I will pour my spirit. How about Jesus when he said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. It was a fulfillment of what God promised in Isaiah. God said that he would pour his Spirit out. God promises to pour his Spirit out. You want more Holy Ghost? That was kind of quiet. <laughs> You should say, I want more. Lord, I want more Holy Ghost. More of you, Lord. More of your presence every day. I've got to have more. I don't want the Spirit to stop. You know when the Spirit stops? When there's no more empty vessels. That's when the Spirit stops. Do I have scripture for that? Yes, they began to pour the oil into the vessels. And then the widow said, go get another vessel. There is not yet one more vessel. Said, And then the oil stopped. But you know, every day I just empty out and make room. Any pack rats here? Hoarders? I tell you what, I have been in some hoarder households where you literally 
They just have things stacked. And you're like, like a walking through a... Some people are spiritual hoarders. And, and, and the mentality of the hoarder is, well, I might use that one day. I better hang on to that. I just can't throw that away. I'm going to tell you right now, a trash can is just as important as a file cabinet. There's some things in your life that are better off in the trash can. Amen. Brother Wolf's talking to you very plain right now. And in your spirit, if you don't hear anything else Brother Wolf says tonight, listen to this. Sometimes in your spirit, you're carrying things in your bag that you're better off not hoarding. It's time to put them in the trash can. Because here's what happens. If you will clean them out, you're going to make room. You're making room for some fresh oil to come in. It's physics. Two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. Do you want to carry that old bitterness and hurt feeling around with you for the rest of your life? Or do you want to empty it out to make room for some joy? I would like to trade in the spirit of heaviness for the garment of praise. Woo, give me the oil of joy. Oh, I'll take joy any day. I want some more joy. I want to make room for some joy in my life. I just need to get some heaviness out of here. Let me get some of this heaviness out. Help me, Lord. I'm not saying that it's easy. Sometimes the Lord has to help you, and you have to just root at it. Dig at those roots. And you just kind of pull it. God will show you. You pray and you say, Lord, show me some things that I just don't need. And help me to sift through it so that I can have room for more of you. That should be how you feel. Lord, I want more of you. Sealed. Go. That's from my... Weasts word studies when I was reading in my Weasts and it was talking about the the wagon coming back at the end of the day and Weasts is an excellent word study he was a big Greek scholar really studied and he has a like a four volume set where he just does nothing but Greek word studies and he broke down all of that Ephesians 1 13 and 14 and he was talking about the Greek culture of the time and how in the marketplace they would set things aside and come back for them later. And you better not get my stuff. That's mine. <laughs> and that's how God feels about us. He puts that, that ownership on it and says, I'm coming back. That's mine. Leave it alone. And as I read that, it just it very much inspired me when I thought about how how God loves us so much. But you, you, you realize in your life that we have to get ourselves ready for his return. And some people say, oh, it's hard. It's hard living for God. No. I'll tell you what's hard. It's hard looking over your shoulder when you're not living for God. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 and 15, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressors is hard. It's hard to live a life always on the run, looking over your shoulder, knowing with certainty that one day your sin will find you out. But do you know where there's comfort? I'll tell you where you can find comfort and peace. At the foot of the cross. Come and bring it to the cross. And give it to Jesus. And leave it there. That is where you'll find comfort. And I'll tell you the beautiful thing.
as you begin to open up your heart and share it with the Lord, you know what you're going to realize? He already knows. He already knows. He knows you're down sitting, you're uprising. He knows your thoughts when they're afar off. He knows every word when it's on your tongue. Just open up your heart, give it to the Lord, and leave it at the foot of the cross. Anybody recognize that on the right? That is coal. Okay? Coal becomes what that is on the left. That's a light bulb. Okay? And so, there's how it starts out. It's, there is a coal mine. I would not want to work in a coal mine. You get black lung, you're breathing all that coal dust, right? It's a very dangerous profession. There you can see the man in there working in the coal mine. Have total respect for all their hard work. There they show you a piece of what the coal looks like when they get it out of the mine. Then they load it onto a conveyor belt and they pile it up. And they'll put it into a giant pile and then a train car will come by and pick it up. And then they will bring it over to a plant. And there you can see it on the very bottom there. They put it on a conveyor belt and then it gets pulverized and then it gets put into a boiler and it builds up heat and then water goes through the pipe and what does the water do? It becomes steam and the steam goes across here and spins these turbines and the motion of those turbines spinning becomes electricity all from coal. Isn't that amazing? Now, if you're in California, you have to add all of that on there. <laughs> there's all of the emission controls and they get the carbon, carbon, there's the carbon neutral plant. And so, I didn't blow that, I meant to blow that up bigger, but this man came and he, <coughs> he went to take a tour of the uh, power plant. And so, He's looking around at the power plant and he's all amazed and he sees the big turbines and they're describing to the, he has a whole uh, class full of kids with him and it's the teacher and the man's describing to him how the power plant works. And so the, the man looks over at the, and he says, well, let me ask you this, sir. Well, where is the energy stored? And the man looks at him at, in the power plant and he says, sir, we don't store this energy. We, we produce it, and it goes out over those lines right there. And somebody, it was out in West Texas, and he said, uh, somebody over in Dallas, it hits a light switch, it's, it's on demand. We put it out on those wires, and somebody hits a switch, and shh, there's no way to store it. You can't store it. I mean, you, you produce it, and it goes out over those lines, and it's gone. We don't store any power here. And I thought about that when I, when I was reading that. Storing power. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You will receive power. And there have been times, I tell you, when I, when I go to camp meeting and uh, men's, men's conference, and I get to men's conference, and I tell you, a Friday night is usually the absolute best. Thursday night's good. Friday night's usually the best. You can tell. You can just feel the energy. And I'm like, I feel like I'm just walking on water. Right? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just take that energy from that building and just put it into a bottle and just capture it and store it for when you need it later? But the truth is, you can't. It has to be renewed day by day. We have to renew our Holy Ghost power day by day.
we have to talk to God. We have to get close to God. We have to move into his presence. And I don't say it like we have to. I say it like you should desire. I would ask you today, what is your desire? I tell you, when I'm at men's conference and I feel the power of God moving like that, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want this to stop. How do I keep this going? That's how you should feel. You should say, Lord, I want more power. Here's another interesting thing to consider. Y'all remember back in 2021, winter, an extremely cold winter. And it was cold for below freezing for like 16 days straight. And it got so cold that that power plant and all of the other ones, they were working as hard as they could, but they could not meet the demand. In fact, those plants became overloaded, and they say that the demand actually crashed what they called the grid. And they're still doing investigations to this day. They're wondering, millions of people were without electricity. And people in our town were without electricity for over a week. A week without electricity, yes. The, the, the grid. And, and we would call up the electric company and they could not give us an answer. They just couldn't tell us. We, we, we can't tell you when it's going to come back on. There's so much demand. It, it crashed the system. And I thought about it as I read that. I have good news for you. Our God has an inexhaustible supply of power. Oh, no matter what you need, you can just reach out and you can say, God, I've got to have more power. All these people were freezing and they were turning up their heaters. They were going, more power, I need more power. And all of a sudden the light started blinking and it went out. But you don't have to worry about that with God. If you need more, you just say, God, give me more, give me more, give me more. And the power is just going to keep coming and keep coming. And God's going to give you strength. And you're going to say, I don't know where all this strength is coming from. But He is my strength. An inexhaustible supply. You shall receive power. That's what it says. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is coming up unto you. In fact, Jesus said right there, all power is given unto me. But you don't understand, I got some big problems going on in my life. I've got big challenges. There's things that I'm facing. What does that say? All power. You're not going to overload the grid. Right? He'll be able to handle it. My God will be able to supply. Oh, somebody just needs to step out in faith and say, God, I know you can do more. I know, God, I know you're able to do it. You have redeemed me. You have called me. You have chosen me. You are coming back for me. You are my God. You cannot forget me. That's what he said. I cannot forget you. I have graven you upon the palms of my hand. I love that scripture. I can't forget you. Amen. Let's stand. I'm going to find my song here.
Reality. 